The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. And then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, Well, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. He said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in, your, in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of, of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. Well, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, there have been a lot of people who have tried to write a history of the world. Cavemen painted the story of their civilization on the walls of their, of their huts and their caves. Around 70 AD, a Hebrew general by the name of Josephus surrendered to the Roman army and then became a Roman citizen because, well, dead men tell no tales. But he went on to tell, live to tell the story of the Jewish people to uh, the Greek and Roman, a Greek and Roman audience. He provided invaluable insight into first century Judaism and also early Christianity. The Beatles' John Lennon, remember, once said, we are more popular than God. Uh, modern humanist scholars now say, hey, the world is nobody's, so I'll take it. You ever hear about the visitor to the insane asylum who went in, walked in the front door, and was immediately greeted by a man with his hand in his coat who claimed to be Napoleon? And the guy said, who told you you were Napoleon? And the guy said, God did. And down the hall came a yell and said, no, I didn't. So, how does your story end? Is your story a comedy? A tragedy? Is it a love, is it a love story? Every day and in every way, the, in every move that we make, we tell the story of our lives. So, how does your story end? Yet again, this week, is yet another parable of Jesus. Jesus tells a story of a rich landowner who was establishing a new vineyard. The story has a rich man, a capitalist, if you will, carving out a piece of land, creating a brand new vineyard where there hadn't been one before. He planted the grapevines, he built a wall around it, he sent a wine press within it, and he built a watchtower over it. And then he went away. Tenants, poor tenant farmers, tended to the vineyard. Now, this story is in all of the Gospels. And when Jesus told this story, everybody understood him because it was an ordinary occurrence. You see, the land of Palestine in the first century enjoyed an extremely good climate 
for farming and herding. In fact, research shows that it was cooler and it was wetter and generally better for agriculture than it is today. It was located near favorable sea trading routes and land trading routes. And Palestine was a great place to get rich. And, as is usually the case, it was the wealthy who were in a position to take advantage of the opportunity. In fact, during the Roman occupation, most of the farmland, especially in Jesus' homeland of Galilee, were controlled by foreign owners. They would make somewhat minimal investments in the property and, and try to maximize their return. Which, if you know anything about Business 101, that is a good way of doing it. Well, during the long reign of Herod the Great, crop surpluses were very common. But most of the food was exported, and Palestine itself experienced regular food shortages. And these food shortages, of course, drove up prices. And the economic stress combined with Rome's and Jerusalem's high taxes drove many of the poor into something called indentured servitude. In other words, they would sell themselves in order to provide food for their families. Now, tenant farmers, they had more freedom, but they really didn't fare a lot better. They would rent the land from the absentee landlords, work long hours for long seasons, and then wind up returning the lion's share of the profit to the foreign owner. Typically, the tenants barely provided enough food to keep their own families alive. Okay, so here's the picture. Abundant crops, food shortages, and absentee landlords. And then Jesus tells the story. A man plants a vineyard. Now, of course, Jesus is talking about God. This is a parable, you know. And how do we know it's God? Well, we know that God created everything, right? And that God owns everything. I mean, the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So in our story, the owner, God, sends a messenger to get his share of the grapes, the rent, the offering, if you will. But the, renter, but the renters refuse to give it to him. So they beat up the messenger and they send him away. Now, why do they do this? Well, first of all, the tenants, that's you and me, are not comfortable with the whole idea that someone else, the not you and me's, owns the vineyard. Forgetting that God owns the place, and we start to think that instead everything, everything belongs to you and me. So then, if everything belongs to God, that means that you and me, we're not as independent as, independent as we like to think that we are. Instead, we're dependent on God. That means we have to answer to somebody besides ourselves. Concerning how we run the vineyard, or, or the earth, if you will, how we care for it, what we do to it, and what we do with it. So, the owner sends a second messenger, and the renters, the tenants, us, don't give him the grapes. Instead, they beat this person up again. Only this time, they kind of take their time with it. They're starting to enjoy it a little bit too much. And anybody who's ever run a church stewardship campaign knows what it's like to be this messenger. You may not get killed, but you might be abused a little or a lot while you're doing it. Now, first of all, because they were supposed to pay according to the size and the success of the harvest, the renters of the vineyard were tempted to be dishonest about how well they were doing. And any time you've done your income tax, I know you know the temptation behind that. So the messenger comes to get the grapes, and all kinds of object objections come up. Do we need to give 10% of our growths or our net? We've worked, we have worked really hard on these grapes. You know, in fact, the harvest wasn't really that good this year. We'll be lucky to have enough for ourselves. This just isn't the best time for us to be giving. It's been a bad year for folks, not necessarily us, but for others. It's been a bad year. 
Who is the landlord to take the grapes from my family and my friends? Can't the owner just wait and see what the grapes we have left over? And then we'll give those to the owner? And then there are, of course, the complaints. You know, I really don't like the way the owner planted the row of vines there. They're all crooked. Besides, the walls of the vineyard are too low. You know, the, uh, the only thing the owner ever talks about is getting his grapes. The only time anybody comes around here is to collect the grapes. Besides, we haven't been able to get along with any of these messengers. They're boring and they're lazy and they're untrustworthy. So what they did was they beat up the messenger yet again, sent him away with nothing. So another year passes. And another harvest comes. And the owner, again, God, sends another messenger to, to collect, the, collect the grapes. And the tenant says, tenants say, we would give the owner of the grapes, but the harvest hasn't been really that good, and we really don't know what the next harvest is going to be like. You know, just like the owner not to understand and to expect us to give up the security of our grapes, and in answer then, they beat up this messenger and escalate the punishment. The Bible says they traumatized him. They, it says they tortured him, and they threw him out. Now, finally, the, the owner decides to send his own son. The owner sends his son in the hopes that the tenants will somehow respect him and respond more positively. But now everything goes wrong. Instead of getting the idea that the, that the owner really means business now, and is therefore sending his son, well, the, the tenants think the owner is dead. And if the owner is dead, killing the son would give them squatter's rights. In other words, with the owner and son dead, the vineyard, the earth, and all the fullness thereof would now be theirs. They would be in total control. Someday they knew it would come to this. They knew that someday something was going to have to give. Someone was going to have to die here. Either their own desire to own and control had to die, or somebody else had to die. So they kill the son. They kill the son, and first they, first they whipped him to within an inch of his life. Then somebody makes a crown out of grapevines and puts it on his head. Then they wrap a wine-colored robe around him and call him the king of the grapes. They drag him outside of the gates, and they hang him from a tree. And somebody stabs him in the side, and the blood runs like wine. And then they got wildly drunk. Of course, their mistake is that the owner, God, is not dead. Jesus puts it bluntly. He says, the owner will come. God will come and kill the tenants and give their vineyard to someone else. Now, it is at this point that this stops being just a story. It becomes a warning to those that would hear it. Now, the only way that this can be good news is if we finish the story in our own hearts in a different way. That is, if we finish the story differently with our next move. Listen, we've been... We've been exploring the universe, especially other planets in our solar system here for a long, long time now. We have been listening with radio telescopes. We've been looking out visually with powerful telescopes. We have found a little bit of water on the moon and a lot more water on Mars. And so far, even though we have found planets within the sweet spot of different solar systems out there, we have not yet found a place that has life. So as far as we know right now, is the only life in the universe is right here. And we are responsible for it. Now we could destroy it if we wanted to. We could do that in a hurry. We could destroy it slowly. What we do and we say right now, it makes a difference. 
especially because we are the ones that know. We know that God is the owner of all things. God has put us, has put you and I in a garden, in a vineyard, in a world, in a universe. And so as tenants of this garden, this vineyard, this world, this universe, what will you do now? How will your story, how will your story end? Amen.